Yes, my name is Lance, and I'm here today to uh, talk to you about prototyping um, and the art of the question. So um, the one thing that's exciting about prototyping is it's, it's all about doing. So uh, I know it is very early, but I have something that I need your help with. Um, each of you have a blank card. There's a blank card, and you should all have a pen. And it's really important because we have a very limited amount of time, and I need your help with this. So. Um, we're actually going to prototype something here this morning. Um, and uh, prototyping is really all about questions. So does everybody have a white card? Everybody have a piece of uh, a, a white card? OK, do you have a pen? Do you have a pen? Does everybody have a pen? Any, everybody have a partner? OK, here's the next part. This is really, really important. I need you, to, you guys to listen. Um, can each of you write your name on the card? Write your name on the card, please. OK, has everybody written their names on the card? OK, we have about seven minutes to accomplish this next part, OK? Switch the card with the other person that you're with, please. OK, now what we are going to do is we are going to ask a question. One of you is going to be the reporter, and the other person is going to be the person being interviewed, OK? Now, you're going to only, you're going to do what we do. I do this all the time. It's called five times why, OK? All right, so it's an exercise that we use in prototyping, and I'll get to why in a, in a moment. But you're going to ask the person this question five times, OK? The same question. So if we were doing it, I would say, why did you come here today? And then you would answer, and I'd say, why did you come here today? And you would answer, and I would say, why did you come here today? I would do it five times, OK? Do not lead the person in any way. Don't ask any other follow-up questions. Don't go deeper on any other subject. You are merely just asking that question, and you are going to report the key insights to why the person is here today, OK, on the back of the card. Then what you're going to do is you're going to switch, OK, so once you've done that. And then you will end by writing like a two-sentence summary of why that person came here today, OK? So is everybody clear? You're going to interview each other. You're going to ask this question five times, no matter how awkward it feels. You're not going to lead the person that you're asking. And you need to go, starting now, please. <laughs> OK, if you haven't switched net yet, you want to make sure you switch. And when you finish, please write the summary on the other side of the card. OK, uh, thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Uh, so really quickly, um, uh, any insights on what that felt like, asking the same five questions over and over again? Anybody? Anybody want to share what that felt like? Anybody in the audience? Yes, yes. Uh, number five was the hardest question to answer. Number five was the hardest question to answer, OK. Anybody else? Yes. OK, it gets deeper and more interesting as the questions go forward. Uh, anyone else? Any other insights? Yes? Well, I thought it was actually you. Thank you. I can, I can have to. No, well, we happened to laugh a lot while we were asking again and again. Okay. We were playing with the question as well, just okay. getting very more curious as if we haven't asked the question three times already. But then it became humorous and, and funny. OK, so it became funnier as you went. Uh, one, one thing that's very important about that is it's an active listening exercise, right? Because at a certain point, you're not any time that you're ever asking somebody a question, you're kind of you're listening to what they're saying, but you're thinking about what you're going to say next, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a really great active listening exercise. And what's really important about prototyping is it's really all about the question, right? So I'm going to share why I came here today. OK, I did this. I cheated. I kind of did it in advance. Uh, because Liz asked me to, and it makes number eight. It's a nice number. Uh, I believe that we're at an amazing moment in time. Um, and uh, I think it's unprecedented. Uh, because I believe many of the answers rest in the people who are in this room. And uh, in addition, I want to uh, I kind of want to move beyond talk and into action. And then the audience is ahead of us. And unless we wake up to the challenge, and see it as an opportunity, I think we, uh, I don't want to, um, not continuing on the dystopian thing, I, I, I see incredible opportunities. But I think one thing that is inspiring is I, I want to kind of tell you a story that kind of frames this, I think. Um, my son is six, and I, I don't think I have found uh, inspiration more than from my son. 
uh, he's incredibly inquisitive and really quite uh, creative. And I think that there's a childlike sensibility that's really quite amazing to that. And what I want to tell you a story about is my son, probably if anybody has children, or maybe some of you have actually engaged in Minecraft. Uh, I'm sure you can tell it's Minecraft, but it's blocked by the bottom there. But Minecraft is this really amazing sandbox game. So my son, probably about uh, maybe six months ago, him and his friends became really fascinated with Minecraft and uh, would just start playing it. And what was interesting was, as he would go through, he he became more and more interested in how to create things in that world. And I purposely didn't tell him anything about the game, and I let him play, and then he brought me back like two or three days later, and he had created these houses, and he had put all these bookshelves in them, and he had torches, and he was locking up zombies, and he was doing all kinds of crazy stuff within the game. Um, and he was in, being informed by his friends as he was playing. But what was really interesting about it was at a certain point where my son came to me and he said, um, Dad, what's screen capture software? And I said, why? Why do you want to know? And he said, well, um, I'm really interested in these Let's Play videos. I've really gotten into this Stampy Cat. And Stampy Cat, for anybody who doesn't know, he's from the UK. He's 23 years old, serves up about a mil uh, 130 million views per month and about 3.5 million subscribers. And he tells stories within Minecraft and tells people how they can actually you know, what they can do within Minecraft. And so my son had seen those and he wanted to make his own Let's Play videos. So now we're six episodes in. My son has made six episodes of these things. And he sits down and he literally starts and he says, this is what we're going to do. And he starts telling these stories and he starts going through and his friends and him are sharing these things. They're their own like media, little media companies, right? <laughs> and uh, what's exciting about that is uh, that the barrier to entry is incredibly low. You know, when I wanted to make something, I had to organize all the people, get them to come out. I had to do all these crazy things. I had to shoot on something, borrow a camera. I had to edit it together. It was a whole major ordeal. For my son, he's just sitting there playing and telling stories. So I, I wonder in some ways, you know, those, you know, formerly known as the audience, they're storytellers too, right? So what does that mean? In, he's six now, but in a short period of time, and for all these people who are effectively making work and feel as though they're storytellers, what does that mean? And what does that mean to us as creators in, in terms of what the opportunities are? So, you know, the reason that I think the questions are really important is I think sometimes we become obsessed with the answers and we miss the larger opportunity. And so when I think about how my son is always asking questions and I think about how my son is being incredibly creative, um, I'm kind of look, looking for these ways in which I can start to get myself into that same space. And so that exercise that I ran you through and, and when I'm doing things with teams, we're always starting with analog elements, always. You know, and what I try to do with the teams that I work with is we start analog and I will bring together as many diverse people as I can into a space and I will create a sandbox. I will create a way that we will literally tackle or shape a design question. And we will use that as our, almost like our guiding principle to lead us through as a filter. And so the rooms that I have now aren't just production designers or uh, you know, my, uh, my DP and things like that. It's uh, creative technologists, it's data researchers, it's people who are doing systems thinking. It's, it's a, a mix of this amazing group of people because the work that I'm doing is really kind of mixing these elements. It's missing, mixing story and play and design thinking. And, and I think one of the fundamental things that was a shift for me was when I started to embrace more design thinking type principles and started to think about this, this balance um, because I, I, I was just seeing more and more this friction between uh, story and code and this need for, uh, I had diverse teams and diverse needs and um, there was almost like this grammar, there was a gap, you know, like the people who were on the creative side were having major issues talking to people who were on the technology side and it was constantly like hitting up and there was this friction and this story and code anybody that develops and develops stories knows what that process is like when you're developing code it's it's totally different so they're constantly hitting up against each other and the challenges of trying to convey something and working in a process where you're rapidly prototyping something. It's, a, it's like kind of embracing an agile method with the way you work. Software development will kind of have a waterfall practice, which isn't too dissimilar to the way films are produced. And then agile development is like this idea of rapid prototyping, setting priorities, figuring it out, and kind of 
immediately trying something and testing it. And the more that you can put it into people's hands, the, the more readily it becomes available uh, or it becomes obvious. You know, when you're a filmmaker and you sit and you kind of write a script and then the time that you actually maybe get some notes from some people and then the time when you're actually showing it at the end, you know, it's often too late to do anything. And you're just sitting there praying, like, I hope everybody loves this because it's so great. And you're convincing yourself that you've made something wonderful when, in fact, you've missed all these previous opportunities to improve the work. So the thing that I've become fascinated with is this idea of how can story drive innovation? And what can that look like? So one of the things that we're doing at the Digital Storytelling Lab, I teach at Columbia University, one of the things that we're doing is we're experimenting with those types of things. And the, and the first thing that we're doing is I kind of looked back and I looked at uh, Sherlock Holmes and I looked at the work of Doyle, uh, which is recently in the public domain. But also there was an element of it that was so fascinating to me. And the innovation part was really interesting because, you know, Doyle was writing about blood stains and uh, not contaminating crime scenes, and he was writing about footprints and fingerprints all before it was normal practice. And he actually, the law enforcement was reading the serialization of his work and realizing, oh wait, that's actually a good idea. We should actually try that. And that was the birthplace of forensics. So that's a really interesting moment where fiction is influencing fact. And so as an experiment at, the, at, the, at, uh, at Columbia, what we're working towards is this idea of Sherlock Holmes and the Internet of Things, right? And some people are like, what the hell is the Internet of Things? Well, basically, um, probably by the end of 2015, there'll be one over a trillion sensors in the world, right? Sensors telling you all kinds of things. There's all kinds of digital literacy issues with that. There's all kinds of privacy issues with that. There's all kinds of policy issues with that. But it's a reality. It's coming. It's happening. It's already here. Chevrolet, I think, next year will have all their cars in the 2015 line will be connected. They'll all be connected. Appliances, all kinds of crazy everyday objects. The New York Times had an interesting project that they were doing out of their R&D efforts that was looking at the archive of the um, the archive of the New York Times, 140, 160 years, and they were looking at how they could use inanimate objects to repurpose that archive. You know, whether it be a street post, whether it be uh, some mailbox or whatever it was, they were just playing and exploring with how these objects could tell stories. How could they be discovery points? How could they help people to not only find things, but also enrich the storytelling of the landscape of a city? And so with the Internet of Things and Sherlock Holmes, we're experimenting with two, two core elements. We're experimenting with this idea of challenging how authorship works. So anybody's welcome to come and participate within this project, and we kicked it off last week. And all I know, which is great about it, is that a year from now, at Lincoln Center, we will be presenting something. I have no idea what that is. That's part of the whole experiment, right? It's about letting go and seeing what happens within that context. But at the same time, we're tying it into a massive online course at Columbia, and we're challenging the way in which whatever we produce out of this the Internet of Things, uh, hybrid with Sherlock Holmes, whether it be a product, a good, a service, whatever it is, um, we'll be doing and playing with an idea of co-ownership of what that model is. So almost when somebody takes the class, they can pay, or when somebody actually, um, when somebody actually um, takes the class, they can pay for the class, but then the idea is that we're trying to give them a residual on the back side, which is kind of crazy. And it's a total experiment. So you can check that out. And I encourage you guys to do so. So I have a couple questions that I hope will help to frame what we are doing here over these next couple of days, because there's a really wonderful group of people here who are here. Um, I'm constantly trying to find a way to, uh, to, to, to do this. You know, how can we harness technology to evoke empathy and emotion while at the same time enabling an intuitive, invisible, and fluid storytelling experience for the audience? I'm constantly trying to make the technology invisible. Uh, you know, I'm trying, like, this idea, and I'll go to the next question, uh, the, you know, how can story drive technology as opposed to technology determining how stories are made, told, and shared? Why can't humanity drive technology as opposed to technology driving humanity, right? And a lot of those ideas are not new ideas. They come, you know, if you want to know more, you can go back and look at calm technology. Um, there's a whole bunch of really interesting theories around that that were from the early to mid-90s. But this idea of we're constantly stuck in a position where 
uh, we're bowing to platforms and pre-existing systems and um, technology that already exists. So how can we build funding structures that are adaptive to the ever-changing digital landscape? So instead of being into something where we have like check boxes that we're kind of checking off these boxes and saying, well, it needs to have this platform and it needs to hit this format, you know, how can we be more adaptive? How can we rapidly prototype with what we do? Instead, instead of spending so much time kind of working to what we think is going to be is going to work at, at the outcome, and then only realizing when we get there, it's a pale comparison of what we hoped it could be. So um, the, this last one, I think, is really important. You know, How can we build a sustainable industry that values the work of creatives and is transparent, fair, and innovative? Right? It's, uh, we're at this really interesting time where creativity has been devalued. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity to kind of flip that on its head. And, um, and I think it's interesting because you're seeing it all over the place. You saw it recently with the whole partnership uh, between I t uh, Apple and U2, right? It was like, okay, well, U2 can't sell things the same way that they do anymore, so now they're going to bundle it and spam you for no knock to U2. They're going to spam you for you know, a $100 million deal, and all of a sudden you can't necessarily get it off your device. You know, um, so I think this idea where the hardware manufacturers are in a really sweet position because <laughs> they constantly keep selling you new phones. It's this fetish, you know, which has all kinds of, eco you know, um, ecological and environmental issues to it uh, aside. But um, I wanted to end with just some resources. Um, the first is Learn to Share. It's a, an event that I run all over the world. We have these free books. You can download them all. We've done six of them. Um, they include all kinds of methods that we use. They include um, all kinds of uh, ways that you can tackle collaborative design and work with dispersed teams. Um, and uh, I highly recommend it, and you can check it out. And we do traveling events as well. Um, and then uh, this one's cool because it was an experiment. Um, I wrote a book with, uh, via Twitter. Um, I was approached by a major publisher to write the book, but then I felt like the advance, I felt like the deal wasn't very good. And then I thought, okay, by the time I finish it, you know, I'm going to want to write it again. So I thought, oh, well, why don't I just write it in Twitter? So I wrote the whole thing in Twitter, 140 characters at the time. It only exists in 140 copies. And the best part of this experiment is um, whoever purchased the book, I ended up doing a 30-minute talk with, and I talked to all these amazing people all over the world. So I learned about what was happening all over the world and what people were doing with storytelling. So I wanted to close with this just because it was so simple. It was a simple action of doing something, putting it out to the world and experimenting with the idea of abundance and scarcity. And I think, uh, you know, in closing, it, it is not the answer that enlightens, but the question. And I think that the opportunity that we have while we're all together and we congregate and things like this is the opportunity to really push and challenge ourselves to ask those questions, those hard questions. And, and maybe like kind of like Sherlock Holmes, somewhere in that digital landscape of, uh, a, a, I don't want to make the, well, I'm going to make the analogy, to a crime scene, you know, are these minute possibilities that could change the way the whole industry works. And the beauty is you have no idea where it's going to come from. So I want to thank you very much.